VMware.com's The Brown Bag. I'm Anthony Hook. I will be your tour guide for the evening. Tonight we have Thomas Hatch and Mike Place talking about configuration management with salt stack. Um, thanks, guys, for joining us here tonight. Um, I understand that maybe we had a live demo at the end, but maybe maybe that won't work out, but we'll figure it out as we go. Um, Want to give us a little short intro on uh, what you're going to be talking about tonight? Uh, yeah, this is Tom. Uh, everybody hear me all right? They all said yes. <laughs> Excellent. All right, so what we're talking about tonight is going over uh, an overview of SaltStack, an overview of SaltStack and config management, um, talking a little bit about the project, and uh, uh, also talking about how SaltStack goes beyond config management and really opens up DevOps to be able to uh, do a lot more with respect to autonomous infrastructure. Awesome. Just a few notes that I'll have before we get started over on this end. Um, you can join us on the conversation on Twitter. I watch the V Brown like hashtag. Tweet any questions. I'll try to get to them as soon as I can and uh, get those answered for you. Um, let's see. You can ask your question in the GoToMeeting window here, and I can uh, relay that for you. Um, this episode and all of our past episodes are available online at professionalvmware.com. We have a YouTube channel and an iTunes channel. so. Turn your feed readers over there if you want to catch any of the other DevOps series. Uh, we've had some really cool ones so far. Uh, a lot of a lot of things that I didn't know I wanted to play with until until I watched the webinar. So, um, lastly, don't forget the other shows around the world. We have we have the EMEA Brown Bags every Tuesday, IPAC every other Thursday, and our late Pam every Thursday as well. Um, that's, oh, here, let me flip to the next slide here. Boom, there's some other information. I always forget to flip to this slide. So um, catch those guys on Twitter. I'm here on Twitter. Um, some of the other schedules, um, other information, that's really all I have. So with that, I'm going to present. Uh, Tom, I'm going to pass over to you. All right. There we go. All right, can you see my top slide here? Um, I see salt on the left-hand side. Yeah, it looks like we need to shrink that by about a quarter there, Tom. Yeah. Yeah, it looks pretty wide right now. Shrink it by a quarter, eh? No, shrink it by three quarters, more specifically. <laughs> we didn't get a chance to test this out before the broadcast, so. Is, uh, can you just do a smaller, do you have two monitors hooked up? I do not. No. I'm having uh That looks better. That's an improvement. Yeah, the problem is I have no idea what uh, what anyone can see either. I have uh, top half of the screen is gray, and I see the salt stack logo and a white rectangle on the bottom half. Tom, why don't you just uh, go ahead and advance to the next slide? I'll uh, I'll talk you through what's on each slide, and we'll just go from there. We're on uh, thoughts on DevOps, the uh, unicorn versus the uh, plow horse. All right. Well, this is this is terribly embarrassing that uh, I'm not able to line my screen up in such a way that we can actually present these. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So let me. Uh, can you do your resolution in? Uh in, in like a 12 by 800 something on whatever you're running? Yeah, that's the problem is the uh, whatever I'm running. <laughs> yeah, 
Uh, Tom and I are both uh, are both Linux guys, so uh, we're a bit out of our element uh, when it comes to uh, these sorts of uh, these sorts of things. Ten twenty four by seven sixty eight. Yeah, that should work. And okay, how about now? What do, what do you see? I got half of PC settings and half of the slide. It looks like. We're getting closer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, closer is right. There we go. All right. Sorry about that terrible introduction, uh, but uh, hopefully you can see the slides now. Correct? I can. I can correct. see the slide. There's a little extra, but that's okay. All right. Well, we will take what we can get. All right. So, the first thing that I really want to talk about here is as we start talking about DevOps and start talking about infrastructure automation, I mean, usually when we, when we uh, look at things from a salt stack perspective, um, while, we're, we're, while we're generally known for our config management, and our config management is a very big part of what we do, a lot of what SALT is designed to do is to automate the tasks that happen um, around config management and making the entire autonomous view of an infrastructure a lot more seamless. And so, I mean, a lot of what we're trying to say here is that SALT, is, that SALT stack is made to do very, very difficult things. SALT stack is made to be able to um, take care of a small and uh, easy to manage infrastructure or easier to manage infrastructure, but also be able to grow into doing extremely complex tasks all the way up the pipeline. And we're going to see that with respect to um, the different uh, capabilities of our config management system, how those capabilities differ from uh, other guys in, in configuration management. But also as we go and we talk to the different aspects of scale and communication and the remote execution backplane that's inside of SALT. So again, it's all about doing complicated tasks. It's all about being able to handle an infrastructure regardless of how strange or uh, custom the needs of that infrastructure are. So a little quick background on SALT Stack, the company and the project and where we've been and where we've come from. Um, I started writing the SALT project in February of 2011, um, and it has grown into one of, the, one of the biggest Python development communities and Python, Python projects in the world today, uh, which is very, very exciting. Um, we merge a ridiculous amount of pull requests as the code base continues to, to grow and be refined. Um, the company behind Salt Stack was founded in August of uh, 2012, and we're currently around 40 employees and growing very, very quickly. Um, we're actually in the middle of uh, a lot of growth to just kind of keep up with our customer demand. Okay, so the ideas inside of Salt are ideas that are heavily targeted towards what uh, uh, towards where infrastructure platforms are going. What we're looking at right now is that infrastructures continue to grow in size year over year. And when we look at larger companies and smaller companies, we're finding it much, much more common that even smaller companies and smaller deployments need to manage uh, more and more systems and more diverse systems to abstract their platforms. We're also seeing that uh, larger companies are growing in an exponential way. Um, just a few years ago, uh, some of the largest infrastructures that we were interfacing with were around 20,000 uh, servers. And those same infrastructures that uh, were using SALT two years ago, almost um, across the board, have grown in size between two, or sorry, between 100 and about 250 percent. 
And so we're seeing that the entire scope and scale of infrastructure size continues to get bigger, continues to get more complex. And the other thing that we see is that as tools come out that help simplify what's going on inside of infrastructures, ironically that only allows us, allows people to build more complex infrastructures in the long haul. So again, SALT is, is, has been engineered to be able to handle not only massive scale, but also to be able to handle an extremely diverse and extremely custom um, infrastructure requirements. So if we look at the if we look at the user base and um, and some of those high level tasks, the salt is made to and is actively used um, to solve. What we see is that we we also see a number of different types of groups that use salt. So we're extremely popular in DevOps groups, but at the same time we have a lot of uh, site reliability groups that use SALT. We have a lot of desktop manager management uh, groups that use SALT. Um, we've got a lot of large-scale cloud infrastructures and the teams behind those using SALT, etc. We've also got a lot of companies that use SALT as a backplane for managing their own internal products. Um, a good example of this is uh, SALT's usage inside of projects like Kubernetes. Um, which is used to help set up and manage uh, the nodes that sit below Kubernetes, as well as things like uh, like the Ceph project's uh, Calamari uh, software, which uses which uses Salt to uh, under the hood to help communicate with and manage uh, Ceph. And so again, it's all about the diversity, the ability for Salt to go out there and interface with um, a lot of different problem sets. Okay. Now when we step outside of configuration management, and we're going to spend a little more time um, talking about config management, I know that's a lot of the focus of what we want to talk about here, but when we step outside of configuration management, we're able to start looking at um, a couple other subsystems in SALT that are very, very popular. One of them is the cloud orchestration system. SALT's cloud orchestration systems uh, normalize access to a huge number of clouds, uh, public and private, making it very, very easy to configure deployments so that they can happen across, across both public and private clouds, configure hybrid cloud environments, and configure um, a number of different scaling scenarios, be it manual scaling or completely autonomous scaling. Um, one, one of my favorite examples for the cloud orchestration inside of SALT is that when we directly combine the configuration management aspects of SALT, the cloud orchestration and cloud management aspects of SALT, but also SALT's event bus and its remote execution engine, that we were able to get real-time monitoring information from uh, we were able to get real-time monitoring information from a deployment, which which allows us to make autonomous decisions about cloud growth. And since that information is directly tied into the configuration management system, those autonomous decisions mean that um, real autonomous scaling is a reality and allows us to make highly customized scaling. So let me wrap that up inside of, inside of a use case. We, um, we had one customer come to us and what, what they wanted to do was be able to automate the, uh, the scaling of their cloud based on um, the business SLA requirements that they're running into. And so it wasn't just a matter of saying, hey, here's a slick way to deploy your uh, application, which we were doing that as well, but it was also able to, to, we were also able to build the custom monitoring systems that allow, in, in a very short order, we had, this, uh, we had this system fully operational in a, in a matter of two weeks. 
uh, but build all the custom monitoring systems in so that the configuration management engine and the cloud engine could be reactive to the real-time changes inside of their infrastructure so that if they were getting close to not being able to meet their SLAs, they could automatically burst or scale into um, the cloud environment that they were running on. And this, uh, this, one, uh, this particular user was actually on SoftLayer. So actually, let me, let me cover one more use case that, uh, that, that, we, that we're really excited about with the cloud system. And that is that, um, we, and we've seen this in a number of scenarios now, and both, uh, both just users as well as customers that we've helped set this up on. Um, but using Salt for on-demand, high-performance computing systems. This is something that is becoming uh, much more relevant in the market where we have, where we're seeing companies that they need to burst into a cloud to do very specific computational tasks. Um, so for instance, a lot of rendering uh, for video game companies. Um, or uh, we work with a number of universities where they take their existing high performance computing system and are able to burst that um, into a cloud. And uh, whether that be a private uh, VMware cloud or whether that be um, a public cloud like an, a like an Amazon AWS. And the cloud management system is able to not only make that bursting happen, uh, but, but it is also able to do things like, like, like I think you probably hear it too, eh? Yeah, there's, there's been a bit of a noise, a little bit of noise back there. So, so what, uh, so what, so what we've been able to see is not only uh, bursting into clouds for on-demand, on high-performance computing resources, but also being able to arbitrage it so that uh, SALT has been able to automatically detect where the most cost-effective resources are so that it can burst these resources across multiple public and private clouds based on load, um, cost of things like Amazon Spot instances, and uh, make the whole process very, very smooth. So. Another thing that I want to talk about is, again, coming back into the diversity of operations inside of SaltStack, the diversity of what it is capable of doing. Um, we've got a number of use case uh, companies. And these companies uh, are using Salt in very dramatically different ways. And I really like to go through these to emphasize that um, from a DevOps perspective, but also from a full automation perspective, we're able to start seeing, seeing that SALT is able to solve really difficult problems in ways that, um, that other automation systems can't. And so if we look at the LinkedIn use case, for instance, um, LinkedIn is a very hardware-centric deployment. Um, uh, the vast majority of their of their deployment is running on bare metal. And so SALT is used heavily uh, without the cloud components, and they use the uh, configuration management systems inside of SALT very extensively, uh, but also use SALT's peer communication system in the event bus. So, there, so it's very easy for LinkedIn to be able to uh, use SALT's event bus to determine when it needs to uh, react to things that are happening in the infrastructure, uh, but also be able to send fan out information based on changes, uh, as well as uh, continuous code delivery. So if we go back and look at the continuous code delivery model, inside of SALT, using, uh, using the configuration management systems in SALT, the definition of how code needs to be deployed it can be done in a very simple way. But SALT's event system allows it to tie into 
continuous integration systems. And so those continuous integration systems can automatically send an event back up to SALT informing uh, the SALT master when a new code deployment is ready, which means that when the SALT master knows that a new code deployment is ready, it can fully automate that code deployment um, without human intervention. Or it can fully automate the development of a canary environment, or it can automate uh, sending information over to the administrator who is responsible for that deployment and giving them effectively a green button to push so that they can execute it. And so we see a lot of that type of deployment inside of LinkedIn. Whereas we look at Hulu and they use Salt again, not, again for app deployment, the management of operating systems and the deployment of systems, uh, but also use, uh, use Salt for hybrid cloud management and scaling into, uh, scaling into public cloud resources as well as managing private clouds. Um, and then the Salesforce use case I find very, very interesting. Um, and this is also a use case that, uh, that Wikipedia uses. And that is that when, uh, when, they, when they discovered and started using Salt, they had already used a different configuration management system um, and were very, very deeply involved with a different, a different configuration management system. But they wanted to use SALT for its remote execution capabilities and for its orchestration capabilities. And so they used SALT to automate calling a different configuration management system. Uh, one of my favorite quotes that came back from uh, from one of the users at Wikipedia was that they said that by using salt they could finally get Puppet to scale <laughs> because they were able to time when the actual runs occurred. But then subsequently new installations that they had um, in these locations are using salt for configuration management as well. Um, <clears throat> A lot of the recognition, recognition that we have received across the board, um, we, I mean, mostly this is in, I mean, we're on a, VM, a VMware podcast and we can't help but uh, wave the uh, flag that we got the gold award for uh, best of VM world this last year. And so a big thanks back to, uh, back to VMware for that. Yeah, I got a question quick. Uh, back a couple of slides ago, you were talking about just some of the some of the use cases and some of the people that you know that do use this. We did have a question. You know, at what point would you start running Salt Stack, or would you start looking at it? You know, it's great for you know for these super large mega infrastructures, but you know, when would be a good opportunity to even begin to look at something like this? So. Um, Let's see. I mean, it really depends on the infrastructure. Some of the smallest infrastructures that we see using SALT um, are down, down in the 10 to 20 server range. Um, and, uh, and admittedly, a lot of the time when we talk about SALT use cases, we talk about these massive scale scenarios. But I've got a slide up here. Um, talking about uh, the SALT SSH systems that, especially in our latest release, have been refined extensively, uh, which allow for extremely simplified control of very, very small deployments as well. One of the things that we run into is that, is that we do see a threshold that um, people are drawn away from in-house solutions or SSH-based tools uh, generally when they reach uh, somewhere between 50 and 200 servers. Um, but in the same token, there's no reason why they can't start using salt earlier on. And so when you're looking at a smaller infrastructure, usually uh, people don't want to have to deal with setting up a salt master. They usually don't want to have to deal with uh, having, having those dedicated resources for management. And again, that's where SALT SSH comes in. Um, and with SALT SSH, we see people using that in, you know, over just a few systems or over many hundreds and uh, 
and already over many thousands of systems. So I guess I'm being terribly verbose in my answer, <laughs> uh, but it's you can start using salt in a very, very, very small scale and start to see benefit. Sure, yeah, the person that asked the question said, for instance, like small, medium business, 75 servers across three hosts, and uh, that seems to fit, you know, to fit your model there as far as, you know, you, like you said, you have somebody or you know of an environment that's just got, you know, 20 ho or 20 servers or so, and, and they're looking into it or are using it. Yeah, we yeah we have many many environments that are that are down in that very very small range. It's extremely common. Um, I mean, I, I we we've even got people all the way down to, and it's extremely common. We're seeing now that people are even just automating their desktops. One of my one of my favorite small scale use cases is uh, is when people use salt to manage the raspberry pies in their house. <laughs> That's actually something that I haven't considered, but even even like a network stack and an Arduino. That's interesting. All right. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, uh, one of, one of my favorite was uh, somebody came back and said that uh, they were sick of having to go over and uh, manage the media systems at their parents' house, and so they just salted everything and had them all uh, connect back into a central salt master back. Uh, uh, back at their home, and so they were able to just use salt to always keep their parents' media systems uh, up to date and fixed. And every time they called and said, "Oh, the, you know, I can't watch my movie," they'd be able to they'd be able to handle it. So yeah, all all across the board. Yeah, Tom, this is Mike. I want to jump in with uh, with my favorite story while we're talking about this stuff. Uh, I really like. Uh, we have uh, a user uh, out in Africa who uses. Uh, salt on his uh, Raspberry Pis to uh, automate the configuration and management of his, uh, his solar uh, desalinization uh, units that are, are spread across the continent. He needed something that was uh, lightweight and distributable and highly, rely highly reliable. And uh, yeah, he uses that on those little, uh, little devices that sit out in the desert all day where uh, it would take uh, you know, a guy a day or two to drive to it to, uh, to configure it manually. Uh, I always really enjoy thinking about that one. Wow, thanks, Mike. I, I was completely unaware of that one. I I need to use that one more. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I really like it. Okay. All right. Um, you know, I'm looking at this slide, and this should very much have been, you know, back previous <laughs> when we were talking about project size. Um, but SALT is one of the most actively uh, developed open source projects in the world today. And we've got this lined up with uh, Docker and Mongo, which are, of course, very, very actively developed, very, very exciting projects. Um, and this, uh, this is the number of contributors per month that we see. Um, and to talk again about the, the scale of the project, uh, back in 2012, at the end of 2012, when SALT was not even two years old, it was the eighth most actively, uh, or the, the eighth most diverse development community on all of GitHub, as you can see right behind uh, OpenStack Nova. So despite our youth, SALT has, SALT has grown at an uh, amazing pace. And one of the things that I that I like to emphasize when talking about the scale of a project, and um, we've learned a lot about what makes an open source project healthy. And this is the GitHub Octoverse from 2013, where we were the third most active merger of pull requests and the third most active uh, closer of issues. And by closing issues, uh, we make it a point to not just close things and say won't fix. We are very very delicate with closing things and fixing them. Um, but one of the things that I've, I've found that's really interesting about project health is that it's important to look at all of the metrics, not only how many people are contributing to a project, but how many lines are being changed in the project. What is the volume of uh, change in the project? And it begins to tell you a lot about what the ecosystem looks like. Because if we look at something like Python itself, there, there's a pretty small group of people 
who are contributing to Python, but they contribute large amounts of code. And the thing that has been really exciting about SALT is that when we look at um, SALT's contributor base, not only is it very, very large that we've got well over a thousand people who have given code to SALT now, um, but that all of the, that the people who give code to SALT give code in large volumes, which shows that not only is it a large community, it's very healthy, it's a very robust community. Um, and then let me mention quickly here some of the uh, some of the integrations that we've got, particularly a lot of the work that we've been doing um, around VMware, making sure that we are able to communicate and uh, and work with vSphere and automate uh, <clears throat> automate VMware environments and automate VMware environments regardless of uh, platforms that they're running on. Uh, so also we've got um, a lot of uh, a lot of plugins integrations around making uh, ESXi manageable by SALT as well, since it isn't mentioned here. All right. So, coming back to a topology perspective on SALT. Now, we were just talking about this whole SALT is diverse thing. Uh, but what a lot of this boils down to is that Salt Stack is made to work its way into any kind of environment because of the diversity of its operations. So Salt can be deployed in a way that works for the, for a good environment for any for any type of environment. And so the core topology is that you've got a Salt master, and then Salt minions connect up to that master to receive uh, to receive information that is pushed down. But in that environment, uh, the uh, the minions, as we call them, are still able to pull information independently from the master, and so that's again the very uh, the very basic scenario. But when we go out and we look at um, the situations like multi data center, or situations where we're dealing with a level of scale that you've got multiple logical groups that need to come back and receive commands from a central location. This is where we come in with the Syndic. The Syndic is a syndication system. So it allows for um, one salt master to receive commands from a higher level master so that you can have one master in two different data centers or different masters in different divisions um, and then still have a higher level authority that can push down commands and gather information um, one of my favorite examples of the syndic is something that we see in a lot of universities. Um, I usually talk about uh, Clemson University, where they have their central IT group, which needs to manage aspects of the deployments for a number of different um, a number of different colleges and departments within the university itself. But different departments want different levels of control over their own subsection. But central IT still wants visibility and control into all of these deployments. And so they're able to give each department a salt master. And some departments, like the theater department, doesn't ever want to touch their servers. And so the, the master they have is more transparent, and the syndic can just work right through it. But other departments, like the engineering department, they're able to only cede control to central IP, uh, IT so that all they end up doing is um, some light reporting and, and enforcing some security rules and doing some minor monitoring scans. And so all of these sorts of topolo topological things are made available because of our ability to split the command and control up into different groups and regions. And then the minions themselves, uh, they're made to be extremely lightweight so that they're not chatty on the network, they don't maintain open ports, um, but also so that they're able to act independently um, as agents, which allows us to distribute a lot of the workload, which is one of the big reasons why SaltStack is good at scaling and why we can have parallel configuration management runs across very large numbers of systems. Um, 
With that said, though, we still are very, very aggressive about making sure that the configuration management system, even though it's architected from a high level to scale and be fast, it's also architected from a low level to scale and be fast, which is why in time trials against other configuration management systems, uh, well, I've, I've never seen one where SALT doesn't win the uh, win on the performance in time trials. I'm, I'm sure you could orchestrate one where we would. Um, but we are routinely the fastest um, from the bottom up. The next thing I want to talk about from a, from a topology approach, everything that I was talking about before had to do with um, using SALT's remote execution system over Xerum Q and it's all of the, uh, the high speed optimized networking systems that allow us to get that super high speed and super high scale capabilities. Uh, but something that's really important about SALT is also the SALT SSH system. We've discovered that there is a large demand for being able to deploy and manage systems in an agentless way. And so this is why we developed SALT SSH also, because SALT SSH's uh, backplane and capabilities allow us to reach out to systems that otherwise you would not put a dedicated agent on. And so the benefits of SALT SSH is that not only does it allow you to run SALT's configuration management system over SSH without ever needing to set up a master, but it also allows SALT's remote execution systems to work. This is something that's, that's generally overlooked when people compare SALT with other configuration management systems is SALT's remote execution um, <clears throat> component. Because SALT's remote execution component allows you to send one-off commands uh, to all of, the, all of your systems or to highly targeted groups of systems. And so these one-off commands that are executed over uh, uh, generally oh, you know, over the minion master scenario allow you to do things without having to write a bunch of configuration management um, formulas inside of SALT. It allows you to say, oh, Shellshock came out. I just need to send a command out to all my systems to upgrade Bash. And a single command can do that, again, without having to so much as edit a file. Um, and these capabilities are also available inside of SALT SSH, uh, which makes that really fast, really lightweight, and really easy to use uh, system uh, happen. And one of the other things I'm really excited about SALT SSH for, uh, we just released um, the SALT 2014.7 release, which has added a swath of new features to SALT SSH. And one of them is that SALT SSH uh, has no binary, no more binary dependencies. So it can be installed uh, via PIP or it can be installed in a, in a way that is incredibly simple. And people can start using it uh, right away uh, without needing, again, without needing any, uh, any extra dependencies in there or anything of that nature. So we've really streamlined the ability for somebody to get started with SALT using SALT SSH without having to go through the trouble of setting up all of these complicated deployment scenarios I've been talking about. And one of the big benefits of starting a deployment with SALT SSH is that all of the configuration management uh, components that one would write to work with SALT SSH will still work and will still scale and will transparently function inside of a SALT environment that has uh, that has large numbers of nodes that are uh, that have SALT minions and a SALT master, so that uh, so that you're able to start with something on the very small scale that will continue to grow with the deployment. Yeah, I'm going to interject with a question here. Uh, along with um, some of the automation and some of the different systems, actually it was a, a couple of slides ago now again, um, you know, you mentioned it works with some of the VMware and you said uh, configurations like with the SXI host and things like that. Um, what about, do you know of anything specific to work with the VMware's vRealize suite or uh, previously known as their vCloud automation stuffs? 
So we're very much aware of uh, <coughs> um, the components inside of eCloud, and I'm afraid that we that we that uh, we don't quite have um, those automation components in place yet. Uh, but they are on the roadmap. They are definitely things that we're working on. All right. One other question was, um, uh, as far as integration with systems, um, does it have any integration manageability with um, process control houses like uh, Honeywell, Experion, Emerson, Delta V, Siemens, Triconics, um, anything like that that you know of? Well, that is a that is a great question. Uh, right now, out of the box, uh, no. Um, but integrations in Salt Stack are not complicated to write, um, and if and if we have uh, a customer who wants those integrations, then we can create those integrations uh, for them. It is not hard to build in. All right, and one other question that we had was, uh, it seems to be all Linux-based. Is there anything with Windows guests? Is there anything with, with Windows servers or guests that you can manage as well? Very much so. Um, Salt is not all Linux-based, um, and, I, and I apologize that, uh, that I did not uh, better convey that. I will admit that I have been talking about things from a very Linux-centric perspective. Salt ships with extensive support. Uh, for Windows and automating Windows and managing Windows. So um, extensive support for managing uh, software applications in Windows, installation of uh, applications, um, as well as support for managing network in Windows. And well, I'm not the main guy who manages Windows, but we've got something in the, in the order of 25 to 30 dedicated Windows integration modules. Um, yeah, we're used very extensively to manage not only Windows servers, but also Windows desktops um, and a number of other Windows-based devices. Uh, and uh, I mean, we, we also have users and customers who have gone so far as to use Salt to do things like manage Windows tablets. So yes, yes, we do a ton with Windows. All right, that was a fantastic question. Thank you for, uh, to the asker. Uh, that's all I got for now, so uh, here I am. Okay, thank you. All right. Now, I've actually already talked about this a little bit in, uh, in an earlier slide when the syndic was mentioned, but this is just a diagram showing that we can have these tiers of uh, salt masters that, it, that uh, talk to a higher level salt masters so that we've got the capability to aggregate information and aggregate commands and routines across highly disparate environments. And another thing that I should mention is, of course, high availability is, you know, kind of a thing. <laughs> and uh, so SaltStack does ship with a system called uh, the Multimaster, uh, which does allow for having uh, multiple masters actively connected to multiple minions. And the Multimaster system is made where all of the masters are hot at the same time. So that, uh, so that it's not just high availability, but um, commands and uh, ex and uh, configuration management routines can be sent out from different masters, so that uh, so that a lateral scale can also be accomplished. Okay, I'm going to gloss over this one, but probably because I I see I see this quote a lot more than uh, than I present it. <laughs> um, but uh, one of the things that uh, our guys over at HP Cloud Services came back and said with respect to the overall capabilities of Salt going well beyond that classic uh, just, just the DevOps scenario. And I've already talked a lot about these use cases um, with respect to Salt's, uh, Salt's dedicated capabilities. Uh, talking really briefly about some of the things that uh, uh, EMC is doing. Um, Wow, it says exabyte, it's petabyte. I don't think it's an exabyte system they're managing. Uh, but one of the deployments uh, uh, that, uh, that we're happy to be involved with with SALT and EMC is that they use the configuration management and, uh, and remote execution systems in SALT to manage 
a very large uh, multi uh, petabyte scale um, internal software deployments. All right, now here's the scary part. Um, I've been yammering for quite some time now, and we wanted to have a demo in place. So I'm going, uh, but uh, Mike Place was going to try and put that together. Um, but uh, but we've had some technical difficulties uh, with our demo machines and getting those hooked up to uh, to the WebEx. And uh, so I'm going to ask I, Mike, where are you at? I, I've actually resolved those problems, and uh, I'm ready to give a brief demo. All right. Well, if we'll uh, if we'll uh, let Mike take control of the. Um, All right, Mike. Mike, if you're ready to go, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass the torch here. I did hear your yep. Mac booting up a few times uh, in the background <laughs> at the beginning, so I was hoping that was a good sign. Yeah, I was uh, I was flashing back to my desktop support days many years ago. It was uh, <laughs> not a, not a pleasant flashback. I'd prefer not to do that again. I understand. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, hold your breath. Cross your fingers or whatever you want to do because I'm going to okay. fire this off. Okay. Yeah. All right. Are we uh, are we shared? Uh, I... uh, oh, there we go. I just had to click a button. All right. How there about now? Go. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I see. I was <laughs> thought I had reshared mine on accident. Yeah, you're good to go. We see your screen. <laughs> Yeah, that's this is what I get for uh, for booting uh, away from my Linux partition. But uh, anyway, what I want to do uh, is just uh, it looks like uh, we're running a little bit short on time, but uh, I want to give uh, a brief demo and just talk uh, about few a few of the major concepts uh, that a person who might start using Salt uh, would encounter along their way. Uh, just uh, just to kind of give people a, a leg up uh, when they're learning what the system looks like and uh, give a, a few demos on the capability of things. So just to briefly outline before uh, I begin showing things, uh, what I've done, uh, Tom talked about the topology. We have a, a, what we call a master minion uh, topology, which is a hub and spoke model. It's a controlling master, uh, which uh, sends commands, and uh, minions, uh, which receive them and act upon them. Uh, right now, I am logged into uh, a salt master I have built, and uh, I have four minions attached to it. The first thing that I'll do is I'll demonstrate uh, what uh, basically we consider a, a hello command, or a hello world command in the in salt uh, in salt lingo. Um, this is uh, salt star test dot ping. Uh, and to break this apart, what we have is we have, uh, this indicates that uh, salt will target, uh, you see this shell glob indicating all connected minions, uh, calling uh, the function test dot ping, which will just return uh, what's essentially a ping. What we see here is uh, we've got uh, four replies. You'll notice that those came back uh, quite quickly. Um, and frankly, you know, if you scale this across uh, you know, 5,000 or 10,000 machines, uh, you're not going to see a lot of degradation in performance for that type of command. It's highly parallel, uh, very asynchronous, and very, very quick. Um, so we can see that, of course, you know, we can do very basic uh, communication. We can do uh, things like, uh, let's say, uh, command.run to uh, uh, basically to do a distributed uh, shell command, uh, let's say, uh, uh, bin echo hello, for example, right, right, uh, and of course we could uh, be much more complicated uh, with that. Whether it was uh, you know a complete bash script, uh, a simple bash command, or what have you. Of course, where people get really interested in the idea of remote execution is uh, both in the parallelism, as well as uh, the capability to uh, abstract. Uh, certain common tasks. Um, you know, the classic use case here is package management, especially across disparate systems. Uh, no, I know one of the things we wanted to talk about uh, was, uh, you know, if you've been paying attention at all in the past six months, of course you've heard about, uh, you know, a couple of fairly major uh, vulnerabilities. And having something like SALT in place uh, allows a person to remediate uh, those sorts of vulnerabilities. So what I want to do is uh, give a brief demo of uh, something, uh, let's say, for example, we all rem remember Shell Shock when we uh, woke up 
uh, on, uh, one morning and uh, discovered that uh, we had to immediately upgrade Bash uh, across a large number of uh, machines. Uh, what we can do here is uh, salt star uh, package dot install uh, bash. Hey Mike. Right. Yep. Oh, too late. You pushed enter. I was oh. going to say you could uh, you could show them the uh, how to report on the existing version of bash too. Correct. Sorry, I uh, shouldn't have interrupted. I'll leave now. <laughs> <laughs> That's just fine. But Tom brings up a good point, uh, which is that um, uh, one of the really nice powers of salt is the ability to. Uh, is both to execute commands and to use it as a, as a reporting tool. Um, and so uh, because I was a little bit quick on the trigger here, um, uh, I ended up uh, doing the upgrade. Uh, but we also could have uh, issued a very similar command to indicate uh, or to go out and determine which versions of Bash needed to be upgraded. Uh, needed to be upgraded. And then, of course, we could have issued uh, the command that I just did to do the upgrade itself. Uh, but you should be able to immediately realize uh, this, the remote execution uh, possibilities and uh, uh, the parallelism that's implicit in, uh, in a system like this. Uh, the second thing uh, that I want to talk about while we still have a little bit of time is uh, the idea of grains. Uh, grains in SALT uh, are uh, effectively key values um, that uh, belong to a particular system. Uh, one of the things that we do is we ship salt uh, with a set of uh, dynamically generated uh, default grains, uh, which do things uh, to represent uh, the system at hand. For example, um, let's uh, change this. So instead of targeting all of our minions, let's just target one. Let's target MP demo four, and uh, let's do grains dot items uh, to give us a list of all of the grains. Um, as you can see or hear, see here, we have really healthy or helpful grains, uh, things like um, the shell, uh, the virtualization uh, that's in play. Uh, we have information about uh, network addressing, uh, that sort of thing. Now, that's all fine and good uh, and is somewhat interesting on its own, but becomes more powerful when you realize that um, SALT can actually use grains um, or specific pieces of information about target systems to target systems. Let's say, uh, for example, um, we want to uh, target all of the Red Hat systems. So, for example, uh, we can do something like this. As you can see, I'm typing uh, salt-g to indicate a grain match. We want, to, uh, we want to match on all of the uh, systems which are Red Hat. And we'll say just return uh, test.ping, for example. As we can see, we just have one system. We could do the same sort of thing uh, with Ubuntu or what have you. Um, you could also set arbitrary grains on your system. So for example, if you had a web tier, uh, you could set grains on each of those and then target uh, your complete web tier uh, in a single command, which of course is very powerful. Um, I know we're starting to run out of time, so I just want to uh, cover two more points. Uh, the uh, next big concept that you'll encounter as you're learning SALT uh, is something called the pillar. Uh, the pillar is quite simple but quite powerful. The pillar is a key value store on the master uh, which allows you to store sensitive data uh, which can then be delivered to the minion. We store uh, our pillars uh, in a directory uh, called uh, slash serve slash pillar. We do all of our targeting in SALT uh, via what we call top files. We'll look at one here. As you can see, um, we are targeting uh, all connected minions and applying something called base.pillar. So we can give one set of uh, values to all of our minions. And then you can see in the next line, um, I'm targeting a specific minion. You could also target, of course, groups of minions. Um, and applying uh, an additional uh, set of values, which will uh, apply to those. Now, this is really nice for doing things like, uh, for example, setting passwords in config files, right, uh, or, or what have you. Uh, anytime you need to deliver sensitive information uh, to minions, uh, you can do so that way. Um, I probably don't have time because I want to cover uh, one more main point, but um, I do want to point out that uh, with SALT, 
uh, we, uh, as you can see in this top file, um, this is YAML. Uh, it maps down to a very basic data structure. And Tom sort of touched on this, but I like to emphasize it because I think it's really important, which is that because SALT uses um, data templating languages, we use YAML, YAML and Jinja as our defaults. Uh, they break down into very basic data types that anybody who's familiar uh, with computer programming, even in a very basic way, will understand. Uh, put another way, um, all of the configuration files in SALT ultimately map down uh, to lists and uh, dictionaries and strings. Um, you can see that represented here in YAML. Uh, and I like to point that out because instead of having some sort of very complicated rendering system, so long as you can, so long as you can think about things as, um, as uh, dictionaries or in some languages they're called hashes uh, or uh, arrays or lists, um, it's very, very easy to, complete, uh, to create complex configurations. And because I think I just have one more minute, uh, I want to uh, point out, or I want to do a brief demo of SALT SSH. Uh, we've Actually, been connecting I'm, I'm, to. I'm going to inter I'm going to yep. interrupt you here. You can yep. take longer than than 8:30 or or uh, oh, okay. whatever time zone you're in. We stay an hour. Uh, we've yep. had them go shorter. We've had them go longer. Sometimes we've stayed <laughs> after a talk for like an hour mm -hmm. and just talked about stuff. So take you know take okay. as long as you need. Um, okay. They're recorded. If anybody has to leave, they can always catch up later. <laughs> uh, they're all recorded. So yep. carry yep. on as you will. Okay. Of course. Thank you for letting me know. I just. Uh, I like to be sensitive uh, about people's time, of course, but uh, I will uh, I will slow down. And uh, of course, if uh, if the listeners have uh, any questions along the way, or or if you were Tom, uh, once actually, you actually we do anything. have two. We do have two so far. One was about okay. uh, the Bash update, for instance. So yeah. so if you want to run that command or install a, an application or a package across, you know, distros or machines or whatever, do you have to? Do you have to? you know, get that package from somewhere, do you put it in a repository and mm. deploy it from there? How does that actually work? Right, so um, in this case, uh, the, uh, the minions that I have connected are all Linux minions, all of which uh, use packaging systems native to their operating systems. So for example, um, the Red Hat systems are using uh, Yum. Uh, you know, those systems ship with uh, upstream repositories. So those OSs know to connect via uh, HTTP to those upstream repositories um, and download package lists and then apply packages um, a as indicated. Uh, in Ubuntu, of course, it's, it's dpackage and apt, but it's the native packaging systems on the OSs in question. The nice thing about SALT is that we're abstracting all of that stuff away from you and putting it behind a single um, a single function, package.install. Salt will do the work of figuring out what the packaging system is behind the scenes uh, and speaking to it and um, allowing that packaging system to speak to the upstream repository, whether it's uh, Red Hat's or Ubuntu's repository, or a custom repository that you've defined and you want to store your packages on. Salt can manage those repositories as well. I got it. I got it. Um, so how does that work then with uh, with Windows applications or patches then um, as far as Windows management? Uh, Tom can probably answer this a little bit better than I can because I don't do any of the Windows development. I believe it's... I, I can get I it, don't worry. Uh, uh, Tom's got it. I, I'm, I'm embarrassed, but uh, I, I just don't do the Windows dev, so I really don't know. Okay, so managing software on Windows, uh, we've got a number of different options. Um, one is that Salt itself ships with a simple uh, uh, package management uh, abstraction for Windows, uh, which makes it very, very easy uh, to create a, uh, a Windows-specific install package. And then you could use the package.install command uh, uh, that way. Um, also, Salt ships with support for a system called Chocolatey. Uh, Chocolatey is an open source package manager for Windows. Um, and uh, we are waiting with bated breath, uh, excited about the recent announcement, if you recall, that uh, Windows, uh, Windows 10 is going to have a native package manager. So we will be supporting that 
as quickly as we can get our hands on the native Windows Package Manager in Windows 10. Uh, so yeah, there are many options to manage software on Windows, and uh, and just to, yeah, just to kind of recap, the built-in uh, software management system inside of Salt is powerful and very very simple and straightforward to use. Um, if you go on GitHub, uh, there is a uh, there is a GitHub repository under the Salt Stack organization called Win Repo. Uh, which has a lot of examples and a lot of uh, uh, a lot of Windows packages in it uh, for for Salt. Does that uh, cover the question adequately? Do you I think? think so. Yeah, there was a couple more that came through. Um, just specific, you know, like and um, in, in maybe that GitHub repo. I'm gonna have to check that out. We'll answer it. Like Adobe Flash, that kind of thing, or if there was any integration with Windows Update Services. Um, Yes, we, <laughs> we do have integration with Windows Update Services, um, so we can automate uh, Windows updates in a very, very seamless way. Um, and I don't know about Adobe Flash off the top of my head, but uh, so so while I am about to say I'm pretty sure we've got one in there, I would have to double check um, because my memory may be deceiving me. <laughs> Yeah, these are great questions. All right, I think that's all for now. Um, so you can move on to whatever you're going to show us next. Great. Uh, yep. Uh, I uh, that's exciting because I really want to uh, to demo uh, Salt SSH. Uh, so to backtrack a little bit, uh, up to this point we have been uh, connecting uh, via. Uh, Masters and Minions uh, over a transport uh, called Zero and Q. Um, it, it, zero and Q implies that uh, the Minions connect back to the Master uh, and that they stay connected, uh, that the Master has uh, two TCP ports open uh, and that those uh, connections remain uh, so long as uh, the Minions remain up. Um, but uh, we also have uh, a, an agentless uh, option, uh, as Tom discussed, uh, that runs over SSH. So the implications of this uh, are several. Uh, the first, uh, because as I mentioned, it's agentless, uh, it means that uh, you can use Salt SSH to, uh, to do remote execution and uh, command and control uh, over target systems with nothing more than uh, than Python and uh, SSH on the other end. Um, so while I have uh, connected to uh, a couple of systems thus far over zero and Q, um, I have a uh, a fifth system uh, that I will demonstrate here. Um, and so we can just uh, let me just demonstrate it working here. Um, again, uh, test dot ping. Um, and we can do this. Uh, the nice thing about this, of course, is that uh, for the most part, all of the functionality that's available uh, in Salt over Zero and Q is also available over uh, Salt SSH, which means you can use things like grains and pillars and do package installation, uh, make it a part of, uh, of your deployment system at will, um, and uh, it, nearly anything that you can do with SALT, you can also do with uh, SALT SSH. Uh, so that makes it really, really nice, uh, say for instances where uh, for perhaps political reasons you're not allowed to install uh, demons on remote systems or perhaps you have memory constraints and you don't want to, to have a daemon sit in there. Um, or for example, if you want to use SALT SSH to manage your deployment of SALT, uh, you can use Salt SSH, of course, to actually go out and uh, bootstrap a, a Salt minion or a, a target system, it, it, excuse me, into uh, into being uh, a Salt minion itself. Uh, so Salt SSH uh, is available. Uh, of course, it's uh, slightly slower uh, than Zero MQ, uh, but that's mostly just indicative of how fast Zero MQ really is. Uh, Salt SSH, of course, is still very, very fast um, and has uh, has quite a bit of power. Uh, Tom, is there anything that uh, you specifically uh, would like to see, um, or uh, or anyone else uh, uh, on the call would like to see? Uh, I'm happy to uh, 
to demonstrate perhaps uh, how easy it is to create custom modules, uh, running some basic states. I think uh, I think it would probably make sense if uh, if we toss together just a basic state, uh, you know, maybe something to to install and turn on Apache. Um, I mean, just as a thought, unless you've got a better idea. I'm more than happy to. Um, and we've we've got some yeah, in there. Hey, <laughs> we <laughs> I come prepared. Uh, we do indeed, and and thank you for reminding of me uh, 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 reminding me of that. Uh, so let me back up a, a little bit because sometimes people, especially people who are new to configuration management, get a little bit confused about what we really mean uh, when we say state. Uh, what we're talking about um, in the configuration management world, when we talk about a state, we're talking about uh, an idempotent state of a system i.e. Uh, either a declarative or an imperative uh, a state, um, which, uh, which is really just a, a 25 cent word for saying uh, we want to be able to declare the state of a system and then apply that state uh, multiple times. And if the system is already in the declared state, no changes will be made. Uh, and so, of course, we can do that as a part of bootstrapping a system, in which case, naturally, many changes will be made. Or we can use it to prevent configuration drift, which any of us who have been in IT long enough uh, know is a, a very, very real and serious problem. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, uh, look at uh, something very, very simple here. Uh, something. Uh, that indicates that uh, a Python package uh, will be in, uh, uh, the Python package will be installed. Uh, let's change this to uh, Apache. Uh, okay. So just to go back to this, um, all this is saying is uh, ensure on a system uh, that uh, Apache is installed. So we'll go ahead and do that and. We'll run that and uh, wait for some systems to come back here. So these commands that are running, then, just to interject here, um, yep. you mentioned before, you know, some of the some of this sensitive security things, you know, are located in a config file. When it when it actually checks in, or when the minions check in, is that encrypted back to, um, you know, the masters, or how does that how, uh, security-wise, how do those work? Right, so uh, we have encryption um, that's, uh, that's happening over the transport. Uh, it's uh, AES encrypted, uh, and so uh, you don't have to worry uh, about interception of that sensitive data as it's traveling over the wire. Excellent. Does that, does that answer your question? People about that. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, very good. Uh, so what we can see here, um, scroll up. Uh, I. Uh, I bungled uh, the name of the package. Of course, uh, as, as we talked about before, you know, we're abstracting these various package managers on these various OSs. Uh, because these OSs are managed by different teams, uh, teams sometimes use arbitrary names uh, for uh, packaging various applications. For instance, some of them call it Apache, some of them call it HTTPD. Uh, but what we've done here is we've gone ahead and we've installed HTTPD uh, on all of the systems. One of the things I want to point out here is that because we are, we're using the system package managers behind the scene, uh, scenes we're also pulling in all of the dependencies uh, that these systems need. Um, so let's say, for example, uh, we talked about uh, what a state might look like. Let's extend this to say, uh, uh, let's see, I believe it's called Apache. Uh, Let's extend this to say that the Apache service uh, should be running, right? Uh, which is uh, which is part of this uh, configuration drift problem that we talked about before. It's it's still called HTTPD on uh, Red Hat systems. Oh, thank you. Goes to show you which uh, operating systems I use. You'll uh, yeah, you've got bad syntax in there now. You you're just being silly today, Mike. I, Some of the others it. too. It's uh, you know Apache two versus just Apache as well. It depends on you know. If you're on yeah, Apache. on Ubuntu systems, it's always Apache two. Yep. Yep.
All right. And uh, so what we've done here, uh, as you can see, uh, some, uh, because we've, we've chosen Apache, uh, some of these OSs uh, are using different names. And we do have a couple of failures in there. Uh, we can talk about how to clean those up in a minute here. But let's look at, uh, let's look at the successes. Uh, up here, uh, we've got uh, three and four. We've got uh, the package installed. And uh, we've also ensured uh, that the service is, uh, is running. Uh, what I want to do, I've got uh, over here on another, uh, another uh, laptop, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop uh, the service. Let's say Apache happened to uh, crash. Okay. Uh, make sure that that is stopped. I'm just typing on another laptop here, so don't be alarmed. Okay. Uh, and then let's go through and uh, run this again. This time I'm going to just target the uh, system in question. Okay. And uh, you can see that uh, it outputted that uh, we did in fact uh, restart, that uh, there are some changes here, and that we restarted HTTPD uh, to be true. Uh, you can show part of that state system by running this yet again, right? And uh, we can see that uh, the result is true, that uh, the service is running, and uh, that we're off to the races there. So uh, let's see. Uh, what else do we want to look at? Uh, any more recommendations? Uh, any more questions from, uh, from um, people who are on the line? Yeah, one of them went to you. There was a question specifically on the, on the salt wind repo. Um, and I found the URL, so I'm going to put that in the all chat window. Um, I'll, I'll send that out to everybody if they want to check that out. Um, let's see. Uh, you can tell Mike is a good program, a very good presentation. So Mike, you've got you've got some kudos and thumbs up to your. Oh, to, that's uh, uh, your that, demo that, that's very kind. I am uh, I am trying very hard not to uh, not to have a panic attack. Usually, I'm just uh, as Tom knows, just very deep in my very dark. Uh, cubicle in the corner of the office. And sure. so, uh, well, I felt bad for Tom, too, at the beginning with the whole resolution thing. That, that doesn't help get us started. So, you know, Tom, you're also doing very well. So. Yeah, that's, that's, that, that's a horrible way to begin a, uh, begin a presentation and say, hey, I don't know how to manage computers, but I uh, don't, it's gonna, <laughs> but I can't get the resolution right on a presentation in Windows. That's, that's <laughs> all right. It's Windows 8, and we overcame adversity. So. <laughs> now that's pretty um, lovely, isn't it? <laughs> um, so there's a question on, for instance, um, it's a very specific example, uh, time syncing. Um, can you use it? Uh, is there anything that you can manage with time syncing across systems? Yeah. Um, let, me, uh, let, me ask, let me back up a couple of steps uh, to, uh, to uh, talk a little bit about that, uh, mostly because I actually don't recall the exact answer to this question, but I will show you how to get to, uh, to the exact answer. Um, so we have a large number, uh, uh, to put it mildly, of uh, remote execution modules. Uh, and those are shipped with salt, and uh, they're used to manage most of the things that you need to manage on a typical system, be it uh, packages or system services, uh, GPG, uh, Zipper, uh, NTP, those sorts of things. Um, and I'm just what I'm going to do here is uh, first, uh, you can uh, run a very simple command here. Ours is called uh, sys.doc, uh, and you will get this huge dump of, uh, of functions uh, which are available to you. Uh, and what I was scrolling through was to see if uh, there was a, uh, an NTP module uh, that was in there right now. now. I don't remember off the top of my head what the time sync module is called, but, we, but we've got one. I <laughs> this, am this is the problem when you, yeah, when you ship an API that's got, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, 1,800 functions or something. Oh, yeah, so we've got all the time zone management. Right. Yep. Um, time zone is there. That might be what I'm thinking about. Is the time is the time zone module? I mean, for time syncing um, uh, on a on a on a Unix based system, for instance, uh, it's very easy to use salt to just uh, install and start uh, NTP. Um, 
or to use, or, or if you're on a crazy new uh, Linux system that's got System D, NTP is now built into System D. Um, and uh, by by the same token, uh, we've if, if we have any Windows machines attached to this, uh, we can uh, we can ensure that those packages are that. Uh, I'm, I'm leading into the wrong place here. Let me back up. If we've got Windows systems on there. Um, any uh, any changes to the registry or system configurations can be can be made. Um, so any of the uh, any of the values with respect to Windows built-in uh, time synchronization systems can be directly manipulated. Yeah, and uh, uh, that, uh, oh, go go ahead. I got a question when you're when you're all set. Yeah, I was I was just going to reiterate. Uh, Tom hits the nail on the head, uh, especially when it comes. Uh, when it comes to our philosophy, uh, which is that uh, we like to provide a framework uh, to build uh, systems that, that do the job that needs to be done. Uh, and so for us, it's less likely that, for example, we'll have a very specific module to handle time or what have you. Uh, our methodology has been to say, to do exactly what Tom said. Uh, to use SALT to configure uh, the system's NTP daemon, uh, to ensure that it started, to be able to set the hardware clock, for example, uh, with our time zone module, and to put those pieces together uh, to be able to build things the way that you want them to be, to be built uh, in a very exact manner, instead of uh, just abstracting things out so far as saying, uh, make time go, <laughs> and, just, and just hoping for the best. Yeah, we're we're definitely big fans of doing it the way it's intended to be done for the system that you're managing, and making salt make that as easy as possible, right, so that right. you don't get bizarre corner case configurations that just happen to be done by us. Everything that's configured with salt is something that would be very natural if it were configured manually on the system. Yeah, yeah, we don't we don't believe in uh, in too much unnecessary abstraction. We don't want. To, uh, people to be surprised by what SALT does. Um, and, and so we try to tailor uh, the functions that we have available uh, to do exactly what a person would expect them to do and, uh, and nothing more. Cool. Um, I'm going to go back to one of the points you said about, you know, you can manage config files. Um, what about, for instance, like if you wanted to set certain parameters in like an SS, SSHD config, um, you know, promote, promote, uh, permit root logins, no, or you know, making changes, global changes like that to a to a configuration text file. How would something like that go? Right. So, uh, well, what we have is um, the the master uh, can communicate with the minions, of course, to send commands, but it also um, has a, a file server that can uh, deliver files. Um, so. Um, and the files that it delivers can be uh, templated. Uh, so let me do uh, a, a brief demo of, uh, of how that might work. And, uh, and it, perhaps Tom will come up with a more elegant way to do uh, what I am uh, doing. But uh, I will give it my very best shot. Uh, go ahead, Tom. Were you going to say something? Well, no, I was just going to say. Uh, I mean, if you if you're going to start uh, cranking out an SLS file and a, and a, um, while you're doing that, I'll just kind of talk through the file state. Sure. Um, so so what Mike's going to do is is use something inside of uh, inside of Salt's configuration management system uh, called file dot managed. Um, because and so what he's going to do is set up a um, an SSHD config file as that full config file, um, and then tell Salt to ensure that its minions have that config file in place. But um, where we see, and so he says, file, he's saying, "Yep, we're defining a, a state called file managed, and you're going to get this file from the Salt file server, and it's called SSHD underscore conf template, and it's going to go to." I mean, obviously, he's using slash temp slash ssd dot cfg as to not hose um, <laughs> yeah. uh, the existing SSH to, uh, system. To, to be defensive today. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, 
Um, I, I imagine uh, men, many people out there know what it's like to destroy your demo systems halfway through a demo. It kind of puts a damper on things. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, it wouldn't, wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> that one that one ECL in the firewall that you apply and then suddenly lose connectivity to it, that kind of thing. <laughs> right. Um, so anyway, this is file.managed. So managed is just a function that uh, that's available to um, to the configuration management system. But we could just as easily use one of the other many functions for managing files. Because file.manage says, hey, we've got a file in some place, whether it be on Salt's file server or on an HTTP server or an FTP server or wherever. Uh, we can also say file.sed or file.block replace and say, hey, we know that a file is already there and we just want to make sure that one value in it is changed to something else. And so effectively that allows us to um, deal with those files on whatever level makes sense to the user. Um, I will, of course, caveat that with file.manage is probably the easiest and most straightforward approach. Now what Mike has done here is that uh, he's, he's now in the config file and he's templating it so that he's going to get a value out of pillar um, that he talked about before called SSH secret. And, uh, and then that's going to be applied within the file itself. So one of the things to emphasize while, we're, while he's going through this, and he's, now he's going to make that, uh, that uh, pillar uh, data as well, but one of the things to emphasize while we're going through this is that all of the files that we use inside of Salt's config management system are temp templatizable. And those data structure and that data structure paradigm we're talking about persists, which means that it's incredibly easy to um, work with data structures. It's incredibly easy to uh, uh, to grab information out of arbitrary places in your system, in some subsystems, from other systems. Do it in a secure way and apply it um, to configurations. Yep. Uh... Thank you, Tom, for uh, uh, for talking that through uh, while I was writing that. Uh, I forgot how much fun live coding is. Uh, at any rate, uh, yeah, Tom. Tom very much uh, talked through uh, exactly uh, what we're going to uh, to do here. Um, let me uh, talk through it line by line. Um, oops. Ah, Unix. How does it work? Okay. Come on. There we go. Screens and mirrors. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, you were the one I. You were the one that I want. Oh no, nope, I lied. Let's try again. You were the one that I want. Okay. So line by line. Um, hopefully, uh, this should actually be uh, fairly readable. Um, I want to remind people again that this is just a data structure. Um, here, it's represented in YAML. Uh, if you don't like YAML, um, and some people don't, uh, we have a number of uh, different renderers uh, that you can use. And so whatever data structure suits you, uh, from the very, very simple uh, to the very dynamic and, and complex, uh, we, can, we can certainly deliver. So long as you can render it down into a set of dictionaries and lists, you're off to the races. Um, at any rate, um, what we, uh, what we are effectively saying here is um, we are going to manage the file uh, slash temp slash shd config uh, for reasons that have already been explained. This is going to be in slash temp. Uh, File.managed is going to be the salt function that we call. We are pulling from the salt file server on the master uh, this templated file. Uh, we will apply to it the following permissions, user, group, and file mode. Um, so, if I have configured everything correctly here, um, what we should be able to do is uh, fire this guy off here. Uh, we again say uh, state.sls um, and we say uh, ssh underscore uh, cfg. Done and done. So, as you can see, uh, that was it. That file is now deployed. Uh, obviously, that's uh, a very contrived example, but it should be quite trivial to uh, extend that to uh, how a person might control and templatize uh, system files. 
Hey, Mike, you want to give us a uh, a salt star cmd dot run, um, and then cat that file so that everybody can see what it looks like on that system. You'll need to put yes. that cat in quotes, of course. Uh, most certainly. Thank you. Oh, yeah. And uh, of course, there it is. Uh, and uh, just to talk through uh, what Tom requested there, uh, uh, this command maps out to for all connected minions, uh, run the shell command uh, cat slash temp slash sshd config. Uh, and of course, that shells out to the cat command on the system, and we get the results uh, easy peasy. Um, and uh, as you can see, that is certainly not slow. And uh, the, again, the very nice thing about salt is not only would that not be slow for uh, four connected minions, it would not be slow for 50 or 100 or 500 or 5,000 uh, or 50,000. Now, the reason I asked Mike to do that was also to, to illustrate the next point. You see, we use templating in those config files, but that templating didn't actually happen. As you can see, it looks exactly like the file that we put inside of uh, um, inside of the directory there. And so, if so long, if um, if I can persuade Mike to open up, uh, you're quite right. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. He knows what I'm getting at. I, I did, in fact, make a mistake here. I love making little mistakes. No, no, the template's fine. Oh yeah. I love making little mistakes inside of demonstrations because it allows us to kind of show the depth of the capabilities. And so, yeah, when Mike opens up that SSH config.sls, and he just needs to add a line. File.managed isn't going to run the file you're trying to put down through a templating engine unless you explicitly tell it to. Right. Otherwise, that would just be crazy and reckless. <laughs> right, and uh, Tom will actually have to remind me. Template of, called uh, Space Ginger. Uh, <laughs> Ginger. This goes to show uh, how much uh, actual uh, salt usage I have versus uh, programming on the back end. There we go. And uh, let's go off to the race. Oop. Didn't go quite far enough back yep. there. Uh, there we go. So we run those states again, and one thing that's really slick is that not only has uh, have we gotten a report back with respect to exactly what was done to those systems, we also get an explanation of exactly what was done in a very detailed way. And in this case, we see the diff of the file change, so that uh, you know exactly not only were we able to manage a file and change its contents. But when you get the report back about that file, it has the diff relative to that file change. So you're able to, again, see in a very transparent way exactly what's going on in the system. And that's one of the things that we really try to emphasize in SALT, is that we want to expose to the user um, a very accurate and very complete um, reporting scenario. You, you don't have to re you don't have to refresh the pillar. Yeah. Okay. So what I wanted to do though was show uh, show this with test equals true uh, here. Okay. Uh, we talked a little bit before about uh, auditing and and running things in uh, in a dry run mode. Uh, and uh, the salt state system uh, supports uh, this type of behavior. Uh, here's sort of an arbitrary case showing what would be done uh, if a given command were applied. Uh, but uh, you know, sometimes, especially people who are new to uh, to configuration management or distributed computing, get very concerned that uh, a very simple mistake can have very dramatic uh, impacts in their infrastructure. Um, as obviously, that's easy to do since uh, I just made one or two, but. Uh, uh, we, you can always run uh, these sorts of states in a in a dry run mode to see exactly what would happen, uh, so that you can have a high degree of confidence uh, that you're about to deploy uh, exactly what you expect to deploy. And there was a question regarding uh, configuration and things, and I'm actually going to take a stab at answering it. So if I'm wrong, you can hit me with a stick. But the question is, can you group uh, systems and the relevant configs? And I would. Assume that the answer would be yes, and you would use the 
the tagging for that. Is that correct? That is uh, precisely correct. Yeah. So I learned yeah, something so, today. <laughs> yeah, the the targeting system that we've—I mean, we've really kind of glazed over very briefly this targeting construct. Um, so as uh, as Mike has been running executions, he's either done—he's generally just put a star in, and so by default we target based on uh, based on using just a, a very simple blob structure. So you can say a half of a name and a star. Uh, but he also demonstrated uh, doing it by via grain. And so what this boils down to is that when you are targeting uh, systems, or, or when, when you're organizing what systems are going to run which, which configurations, you can organize those systems based on those targets, which means that you're not constricted to just the name of the system, but you can also target them based on properties of the system. So you can say configuration Y will be applied to all of the Red Hat systems, and configuration Z will be applied to every system that's running inside of a KVM virtual machine. Um, or uh, you can give grains to a system so that you can assign a, ta a grain to a system, and then um, and then only talk to that system based on that grain. So if if Mike were to say do a uh, salt um, uh, MP demo one, and then grains dot set val uh, foo bar space. And then look at the grains for MP demo one, or then tar do a salt uh, grain target for foo bar. We see that we were we were able to remotely assign a grain to a system, and then target based on that grain, and then subsequently we can use that grain inside of uh, inside of a top file or inside of uh, um, or directly inside of those SLS files to determine that based on that system information we're going to change how we're going to run. Um, and this also, I mean, we, we really don't have time to go into a lot of the depth around this concept, but it also allows you to uh, make highly dynamic decisions in your configuration management routines about exactly what and how systems are going to be deployed. Um, so it's it's made to be incredibly flexible. Great. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I really uh, have nothing to add to that. Um, you know, you can use the uh, uh, the uh, either the targeting uh, as you can see here on the command line, uh, or you can use it uh, inside your SLS files. You can you can really go uh, as far as your imagination will take you uh, with the uh, mixing and matching and combining uh, these various vectors, be it uh, pillars, uh, be it grains, uh, be it uh, simply the IDs of systems, uh, to create complex targets, uh, both for remote execution, uh, but more powerfully for orchestration use cases, right? Uh, say, for example, and uh, let me just take a step back to a lot of people um, don't quite understand uh, what we mean when we talk about orchestration. So let me give the classic use case of that. Um, when we talk about orchestration, what we talk about is uh, is performing uh, sets of uh, commands across an infrastructure uh, with uh, some dependency between uh, those steps, right? Uh, so here's a classic use case. Um, it's in like application deployment, for example. Uh, a, you know, anybody who's done application deployment has probably encountered cases where they say, okay, first we make sure that the build passes. If the build passes, then we take uh, load balancers A, B, and C offline. Then we do steps C through X to backend servers Y through Z and then we bring load balancers A, B, and C back online, so on and so on and so on. Um, that's what we talk about when, uh, when we talk about orchestration. 
so you can see how using the targeting constructs uh, of grains and, and pillars and, and, and salt really in general uh, can allow you to perform application deployments and, and do complex orchestrations and, uh, and automate, it, uh, automate it all from head to tail. Well, and I think that that covers the demonstration that we have. Uh, I mean, are there any questions to uh, to finish up? Or uh, I mean, we've we've happily consumed an additional uh, thirty five minutes of everyone's lives. <laughs> no, it was it was that was that was excellent. That was a really good demo, interactive, um, with people asking questions. The only one other question that I wanted to follow up on um, was how is it licensed, or how does the licensing work with with using it? So SALT, um, uh, SALT itself is licensed under the Apache 2 license, so um, it is open source. Um, SALT Stack, the company, um, licenses, uh, licenses an enterprise uh, version, which is the fully com the commercially supported version of SALT. Um, and we have a few additional products that, uh, uh, that are proprietary, like for instance our ServiceNow integration. Um, which is uh, highly targeted towards uh, towards uh, ServiceNow users as a proprietary integration that, that costs a little bit more. Uh, but yeah, yeah. So Salt Salt itself is licensed under the Apache Two license. That is excellent. Uh, I think that covers all the questions. I'm not seeing else, anything else coming in. Um, if anybody's got any additional questions, um, they can always tweet them and uh, take the V Brown bag. Um, hashtag on Twitter, or if they hit you guys on Twitter, or I'm sure they can figure out where to ask questions. So, um, well, yeah, so if, you guys have. Um, I'll just follow up with your question statement. If people have questions about salt, uh, they can uh, they can uh, uh, talk to at Salt Stack Inc on Twitter, um, or we have uh, Pound Salt on Freenode. We also have a salt users mailing list. Um, and uh, we communicate a great deal uh, over GitHub, as I was mentioning before. Uh, Salt is uh, very, very easy to contribute to. We are, it, uh, we pride ourselves on having a very, very friendly and a very open community of uh, people who work hard to help each other solve uh, very specific and sometimes complex problems. So yes, please, please feel free to uh, to ask ask us questions and engage with Salt the community and Salt Stack the company. All right, if that's all that you guys have, I've just been going to um, switch over presenting to me. <laughs> um, all right. Let's see, that's all that we have for this week. Um, tune in next week. We have, and I have it pulled up here. Um, next week on the 12th, we've got a PowerShell primer with Jeffrey Hicks on PowerShell. Uh, on the 12th, the 19th. Uh, v Brown Big US has configuration management with PowerShell. Uh, we are off for Thanksgiving. Um, and that'll take us through the rest of the month with the uh, with the DevOps series that we have. Um, well, we have DevOps series continuing into the next few months, but that'll finish off the month of November. Uh, as always, you can uh, tweet to us, V Brown Big on Twitter. Check out. Uh, a podcast online, check out the podcast on YouTube, you can check out the podcast on iTunes, this is all recorded, so catch up, tell your friends, and uh, with that I'm going to end the recording here once I find this button. <laughs>